Hi, welcome to Marriage and Family in a Global Context. This is the second class, and the topic will be defining families. If you haven't done so already, please read pages 1 through 16 in the course textbook. So today we're going to be asking ourselves the question, who is our family? And if you looked at the textbook, you could see that there is a lot of, there are a lot of questions about who a family is, what people comprise a family, and who do we consider our family? And some of the big questions that were raised are, does having a blood connection to the person really matter? Is our family only the people that we're related to biologically? Second question is, does physical presence matter? Does having them in your life physically make them more or less family than having a connection with them using the internet or using a phone or even, you know, let's go back to Laura, Laura Ingalls Wilder days, pen pals. Like, does that make them any less important or any less of a family because they're not in close physical proximity to you? Third question is, does species matter? And I know that's kind of maybe not that revolutionary of an idea for, for people in your generation, but for like our parents, would they consider their pets to be part of their family? You know, there are a lot of people now who consider their pets to be their children. Um, does that make them any less family because they're not human beings? Um, you know, they're, they're fur people, they're not human people. Does that make them any less of a family? So those are some really big key questions that you need to consider when asking yourselves, what does it mean to be a family? What does it mean to have people in your family? So as we get started, I want to, I just kind of want to think about some of the people who I consider to be my family. And I invite you to think about the people who you consider to be your family as I talk about some of the people who are important to me. So this is a picture. It's about a year old. Um, it's right after I moved to Auburn. Actually, it's about two years old. It's right after I moved to Auburn. And um, I met this girl named Jennifer who works in my research lab here at Auburn. And we became really fast friends. And I would consider her to be part of my family. She's someone I talk to a lot. Um, we hang out a lot. We have a streak on Snapchat, which I think should be a marker of family. Um, but <laughs> that's just my opinion. I would consider Jennifer to be my family. Now, Jennifer and I are not related. And until 2017, we didn't know each other. So does that make her any less of a family? Well, it really depends on your definition. Now, this is a picture of me and my sister, Mary. Mary is related to me biologically. We have the same parents. Um, we have known each other for 16, 17 years now. Um, she's probably my closest sibling to me uh, in terms of the person I talk to in my, in my biological family who I talk to the most, who I hang out with the most. We have the longest streak on Snapchat. Um, as I said, one of my markers of familyness. And as of today, our streak is 388 days. I've only been on Snapchat for 388 days. I only got on it because that's the only way that I could talk to her because she doesn't respond to text messages. So Mary is part of my family and she'd be part of my family by most people's definition because we're related. Then I think about my friend William. William is someone I've known since 2016. I met him when I was at graduate school at North Dakota State University. He is probably my closest friend, um, which is kind of weird because I've known people longer than him, but he's probably one of the few people who I would trust to like make decisions for me if I was in a coma, which honestly right now in this sort of bizarre time we're living is like, he might have to. So, you know, he's someone I'm very close to. I talk to, I don't actually talk to him every day. I talk to, you know, other people more than I talk to him. But when we, when we, he's one of those friends that when we, when we reconnect and when we talk, it's like we have never been apart. Now, I haven't seen William in over a year. The last time I saw him was Martin Luther King weekend in 2019. So I haven't actually seen him in over a year because he lives in North Dakota. I live in Alabama. Um, but that doesn't make our connection and our familyhood any less valid or strong just because he's not in close uh, physical proximity to me. And again, some more of my biological family. And this is my um, brother Beck and my sister um, Piper. Um, my youngest siblings, I have, okay, I have six siblings. I, I was in a large family. We had a 12-passenger van. I'm the oldest. 
Like, it was an interesting childhood. I can't imagine being an only child. I have, my advisor is an only child. I have friends who are only ch children. I can't imagine not having a ton of siblings. Like, it just blows my mind. It's like how boring life would be without all these mini-me's running around. Um, my, my family actually has uh, what's called two families. So I have, we all have share the same parents. So my mom and dad had six kids, seven kids. Um, but they had them in two different, two distinct like cohorts. So, um, me, my sister, Krista, my sister, Catherine, my sister, Bethany are all, you know, roughly spaced about a year to two years apart. And so we all grew up together. Um, and I'm 28. I just had a birthday. Yeah, I'm 28. <laughs> so old and Bethany's 21 so you, you can tell there's not a huge like there's a seven year gap between the two of us uh, between the four of us so they're they're the first family and then there's this gap and then they had Mary um, Beck and Piper and there's about a, a year and a half to two years between all of them and so um, well there's a little bit of a gap between Beck and Piper Piper was sort of a surprise so um, so there's a, Mary is 17, Piper is 8, I think. So there's like a 10-year difference there. So to a separate family. So that's another thing to think about when you think about family. It's like, is is your family, is, is like how, cl how close in age are the members of your biological family? Um, also, are you related? Um, is your relationship a full sibling or half sibling? So, you know, a lot of people assume because I'm in a large family that I have half siblings, but I really don't. They're all, they're all, we're all related, same parents, um, which is, I think, pretty unusual, um, especially now. I mean, maybe not 20 or 30 years ago, um, but with birth control being what it is and the, the ease of access, it is very rare to see a larger family made up of people who are all from the same parents so um, but I'm I'm close to these siblings they live here in Auburn so I get to see them I'm from Auburn so I get to see them um, pretty regularly and hang out with them um, and I would consider them to be part of my family and so would most people because we're biologically related and then of course my kitty Miss Scona you'll learn you'll hear a lot about Scona or Scone Scone or Coco she has many different nicknames um, I would consider Skona to be part of my family. She lives with me. She provides emotional support to me. I provide emotional support to her. I take care of her. I support her financially and um, with food and toys. You can see she has her little Christmas stocking. And I love this picture because you can tell on her face that she knows that she is spoiled. She doesn't quite understand the concept of Christmas and gifts, but she does understand the concept of possessions. And basically, she owns everything in the house and lets me use it for free. So as long as I feed her and pet her and pay attention to her. So I consider Skona to be a part of my family. I consider her to be my my fur child. I, I love her as much as I would love a child, I think. Um, I mean, obviously, I've never had a child, so I, I don't know for sure. But I mean, I... If the house is on fire, I'd probably run in to save her, which is a horribly stupid thing to do. But I mean, that's something that that mothers do. So I feel pretty confident that I would would do that. So I consider Skona to be part of my family. By the way, I'm sure you're wondering, what is the name Skona? What does that even mean? So Skona is actually Huna. It's Swedish and it means beautiful. And if you speak Swedish, you can laugh at how horrible that pronunciation is. But um, she's beautiful, so I call her. I call her that. But it's spelled S K O N A. So just say Skona, it's easier. Um, she also has her own Instagram because she's the spoiled cat. So <clears throat> thinking about family then, and, I, and I, I've just spent a good bit of time talking about some different people who might consider family. And obviously that's not an exhaustive list. I didn't include my parents on there, even though I'm very close to them because I don't have a good picture of me with them. Um, I didn't include grandparents or aunts. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of different people and a lot of different friends who I consider family who I didn't include just for the sake of brevity. But one of the things that I hope that you took away from that is that, that as I was telling you about these different people, I told stories about them. And I told you about, like, why they mean something to me, why I consider them to be part of my family. And that highlights an important characteristic of family, and that is that family is all about connection. Family is about 
having this bond that's that's both visible and invisible and that that really encompasses different domains. So three of the main connections or domains that family encompasses are the biological, the legal, and the emotional. So let's look at my family in the context of these connection domains. So, okay, let's talk about the biological people. So I talked about my sister Mary, and I talked about my brother Beck, and my sister Piper. So, and we don't we don't always look like this. We, we were intentionally trying to look like that. We were trying to make, it, it was a staged picture. It wasn't a candidate. Obviously, it's a selfie. <laughs> they're my biolog, there's a biological connection. They're my biological family. There is a biological connection. We are connected by a visible bond of like, similar phenotypes and genotypes, but we're also connected by um, an invisible bond that just comes with that, that sort of psychological aspect of being related. You, you sort of have a connection with people, even if you don't know your, all of your biological family, you still feel some kind of kindred kindredness with them because they're your kin, right? <clears throat> so in the legal domain, the legal connection, Scona is my legal family. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't have the COVID. I have really bad seasonal allergies, and they're just really bad right now. My <coughs> voice will get a little bit dry, too, from talking, so just bear with me. Don't worry, I'm not dead. I'll let you know if I get the COVID, though. That'll actually be, actually be fun to teach with that. I think I'm going to do it so I can go viral. Look at this teacher, so dedicated. She's dying of COVID and still teaching. Okay, <laughs> so my legal family. Scona is my legal family from the perspective that she belongs to me. Um, I own her. Now, in terms of legal family, like, you don't actually own them, but in this case, because she's an animal, I do own her. But that comes with a certain set of legal responsibilities. If I neglect her, if I abuse her, then the government can come can step in and take her away from me. The same kind of concept applies. If you're a parent, you don't own your children, but you have custody over them. You're responsible for them. You have the right to raise them the way that you want, within reason, as long as it doesn't violate any laws. And you also have the responsibility to take care of them. So they're your legal family. They belong to you in the sense that you have certain rights and privileges attached to it. So Scona is my legal family because I'm responsible for her. And then we have emotional, the emotional domain. So like Jennifer and William, they're people who I have an emotional connection to, but not really a legal connection or a biological connection. I'm not, I'm not biologically related to them. I'm not married to them. I've not adopted them. They're just people who I feel very emotionally attached to, who the emotional attachment I have with them is, is similar to, if not greater than, certain biological relatives or people who I would be legally responsible to. But when thinking about, and, and I alluded to this earlier with your children, when thinking about these connections, we can't look at them as like solely independence, like this is just my biological connection, just my legal connection, just my emotional connection. These different domains are interconnected with one another. So for example, um, Beck, Piper, and Mary are biologically connected to me because we're biologically related. But there's also a legal connection there. Now I'm not their legal guardian, but if anything happened to my parents, then I would be their legal guardian. I'm their old, their oldest child. Um, I'm the one that lives here. The police, most likely, if something happened to my parents, would would put me in charge of my siblings until the court decided what to do because I'm their closest living and their oldest living relative. In the same way, if something happened to me, they could have a claim on they could have a claim on like my assets or on my body, like my remains, because they're my next of kin. In fact, I have life insurance and they are the beneficiaries. So there is a legal connection there as well. But there's also an emotional connection. So they're my biological family and they have some kind of legal claim and legal connection to me because we're biologically related and we're closely biologically related. But I also care about them and I love them and want them to be happy and want them to be safe and healthy. And I would definitely take care of them if something happened to my parents because I care about them, not just because the state would, would ask me to 
Like I would actually do it from, from an emotional motivation. So like those domains overlap. So co the connection is not just unidimensional. And you'll find as we progress throughout the semester that pretty much everything we talk about in, in developmental psychology and in family science really looks at the interconnectedness that exists. We don't look at things like family or the individual as like these insulated, like inside of a little packaging like thing. Like they're they're interconnected to so many different things. And it's this interconnection that makes us unique and makes us who we are. So I want to remind you to do that as we to think about that as we go along in this semester. Think about how the different things we talk about relate to one another because it's in that relation and it's in that connection that they share that we find the individual difference and we find the uniqueness that makes us who we are. Now, Skona, Skona is legally mine. I do take care of her, and sometimes I take care of her purely because I would get in trouble if I didn't, because sometimes she gets on my last nerves. But I do love her, and as I alluded to earlier, I would run into a burning building and save her because I love her, and it would devastate me if anything happened to her because there is an emotional connection. So so you can, you know, like, like with, my, with my siblings, like there's a biological and legal and emotional connection with my cat. We're not biologically related, but we are, there is an emotional dimension to, our feel, to my feelings for them. But what's really interesting is when different members of your family have connections with one another. So like, obviously I'm not, there's no legal connection or biological connection with Billy and Jennifer, but, um, there are connections between between the other members of my family. So, for example, Mary, Beck, and Piper are biologically related. So they have, as part of my grand of my grand family and their little family, they're also related biologically and emotionally too. I didn't really know how to show that on there. Um, Mary knows um, Jennifer and their friends, and they have a snap streak going. A snap streak, and like I said, snap streak means family. <laughs> Because um, so I guess not always, but most of the time. Um, so there's a connection there. So two like two distinct members of my family who are part of my family through different domains are connected. There's a connection there. Um, Piper and Beck both know Scona. Piper really loves Scona. In fact, Scona was a, was an abused cat. I rescued her and rehabbed her, and she would not let me touch her for about eight months, but she would let Piper touch her. So like there's a co emotional connection. Um, between those two, and there's so there's there's another connection and another way that my family is connected. The different members of my family are connected, even though there's um, there's no like clear biological or legal connection. There's still some kind of interesting interplay that makes the individual members of my family also members of each other's family. So I encourage you to go back and think about. Think about these three domains, the biological, the legal, and the emotional, and think about who you consider family. And just, just for fun, you're like, Darcy, your idea of fun is kind of weird. For fun and to help you understand this better, look at this, this graph and think about how the different people in your family fit on it and how, they, how they're interconnected with one another. That would be a great exercise if you want to do well in the exam because there might be a question. There might be a question on there that asks you about this. So it's a good way to like increase your understanding. So as we talk about talk about family, it's probably also become very apparent to you that family is about commitment. So it's not just that you're connected to each other. It's not just that you have some kind of bond, whether it's biological or, or legal or financial or emotional or what have you. There's also... There's also some aspect of commitment. It's like that connection exists because you're committed to it. So just some general areas that we agree about when it comes to family and commitment is that family help one another. So that might, you might hear that and think, well, I mean, I've got biological family members who don't give jack about me. And I'm like, yeah, me too. <laughs> like I have family members who could afford to help me out financially who don't and who don't talk to me. Like, I get that. And I don't consider them to be part of my family because there's no connection and there's no commitment, right? So like family, we generally agree that family helps one another. 
we generally agree that the people who are your family, who you consider to be your family, stand up for one another. Um, one of my siblings was bullied this past academic year, which was really hard for me because I study bullying and bullying prevention. And it was really hard for me to deal with the fact that someone I loved and cared about was and experiencing this sort of really horrible thing that I studied and that I, that for me is a, had been previously mostly just an academic understanding. And it made me really angry and it made me wanted to do something to help them because family, people that you care about, who you're connected to, stand up for them. And as I talked about earlier, family comes with certain legal and social privileges. So some legal privileges would be like you have the ability to um, like, you know, spend time together, live in the same house. And we had a there was a, you know, a, a, rule, a ordinance in Auburn that says no more than like a certain number of unrelated people can live together in one family dwelling in a single family dwelling. So it's really hard for college students to get a house. Um, if they don't, if they're not related to one another, because only a certain number of unrelated people can live together. So if you're family and you can prove some kind of family um, connection, then that comes with some legal privileges. Also, like the right to custody. If you're biologically related to someone, you have an easier it's an easier time of getting um, legal custody over people because there's that that degree of connection. Social privileges, like we don't really. I don't know if people really think about this, but like the ability to like, I don't know, spend time with one another. That's a social privilege. You don't just let anybody into your house. Like I'm a pretty private person when it comes to my house because I'm not a very clean person. Like I, I don't like, I don't like clean my house, deep clean it very often. So I don't let people into my house who I don't like know very well and who I would consider to be family. That's a social privilege. Um, another social privilege, like that sense of comfort that you feel at texting or snapping somebody um, that you don't necessarily feel with other people, that's a social privilege because you're family, because you're connected, because you have a commitment. But it also, like this privilege comes with um, responsibilities. So certain family relationships come with legal authority and responsibility. And this is most um, clearly seen with people who are married to one another or people who are parents. So if you're married to someone, you have legal authority over your spouse if they become incapacitated. You're given pretty much automatic right of attorney because you're married. It's assumed that because that commitment is there, because that connection is there, and because it's a very intimate and strong connection, that you have their best interests at heart. That's a legal authority. If you're a parent, you have legal authority over your kids. Like They can't go somewhere that you say they can't go. Um, they can't do things that you say they can't do. And but not only is that a social understanding, but it's also a legal one. Like the law, the law gives you the ability to, you know, control your children's lives to, you know, within reasonable boundaries. But that also comes with responsibility. If you're a parent, you have to feed your kids, you have to clothe your kids, you have to take them to the doctor when they're they're sick. You have to make sure they go to school. Um, you have to take reasonable steps to make sure that they have, you know, socialization. Like you can't just keep them in a closet in your house for 12 years and have no consequences. Like, there are responsibilities that come with that legal authority. So when we think about family, we've talked about connection and we've talked about commitment. And we've really alluded to the fact that there are different kinds of people that you would consider to be family. And different, and that that implies that there's a different ways to define what family is, and so um, our our class is going to look at three main types, and this is by no means exhaustive. This is just the way that the author of our textbook has chose has chosen to group um, family, and this is how we're going to do it for for our course. The first type is personal family. <clears throat> Your personal family, and I've also heard this called chosen family. Um, the family or the people we feel we are related to and who we are certain would define themselves as being related to us. So when I showed you my family earlier, that is my personal family because I didn't just include people I'm biologically related to. In fact, I included more people on there that I was not biologically related to than I was biologically related to because, spoiler alert, I don't have much to do with most of my biological family. Um, so 
Um, your personal family then are the people that you have defined as your family. And you know pretty, pretty certain that they would also say that you were family as well. So this could be your biological relate, relations. It could be your parents. It could be your siblings. It could be your grandparents. It could just be your aunt and your grandparents. It could just be your parents and not your siblings. Or it could be your siblings and not your parents. It all comes down to your personal experience. It could also include your close friends. Um, you know, people who you rely on, people who you trust. Um, I said with William, I trust him to make decisions about me if I'm incapacitated. I think that's a really good litmus for whether or not someone's in your family. If you would trust them with your life, then they're probably your family. If you wouldn't trust them with your life, then they're probably not your family. And I have close friends who I would not trust with my life, so I don't really consider them to be family because I don't give them that same sort of social right and legal right and privilege that I would um, other people. And then it could also be step-parents and step-siblings. I have a friend who... Um, I have a friend who sees their has no relationship with their with their biological father, and they see their stepfather as their father, even though their stepfather hasn't been part of their life, um, you know, for the entirety of their life. I think um, his his parents got married uh, when he was like maybe ten. This person has been a huge influence on his life. He considers him to be his father more so than the person who is his biological father. Step siblings. I have another friend. They're a, a blended family, and they consider their step siblings to be, you know, their their full siblings as if they were blood related. So, you know, it all comes down to how you feel. How is the commitment there? Is the connection there? Now, your personal family is the most important type because it influences your early child development. When children are very small, they look to their family for stability. They look to their family for social cues. They look to their family for um, help in learning how to navigate the world. Um, and their degree of attachment really tells you a lot about how secure and how safe and how stable their home life is. But more, you know, beyond just early child development, the your personal family contributes to your personal and interpersonal stability throughout your life. So, for example, you know, if you're having a rough time and you can talk to your family, that contributes to your stability, your personal stability. Um, if you, uh, you know, you grow up in a home where there's not a lot of there's not a lot of um, parent involvement, there's not a lot of commitment. Um, you don't always have food on the table. The parents aren't always around. Then you're going to have personal instability, but also interpersonal instability because your relationships with other people are going to be influenced by the fact that your parents, who you should be able to trust, your family, who should be a rock for you or not, then you're not going to really want to trust other people, perhaps. So this is a very important type of family because it really is going to influence how you navigate your world and how you become the person who you are. And that's why, you know, to go back, that's why it's really important that you that we understand that personal family doesn't have to be people you're biologically related to, because you may have a really horrible home life, but you may consider a friend's parents and a fr to be your parents, you know, surrogate parents and your friend to be a surrogate sibling, and that provides you with that same sense of stability that you may not have at home. So... Again, it all comes down to who do you feel you're related to, who do you feel a connection with, who do you feel commitment from. Now, the type of family that I think we most commonly think about is the legal family, um, and that's really problematic for a lot of different reasons, and we'll get into those reasons um, next time and as we progress throughout the semester. The law and the government don't always do right by families. But your legal family is, are the people that the law says are related to you by birth, marriage, or adoption. So this is really controversial. And it's controversial for several reasons. One, who can get married, right? Like, until 2015, I think, I think it was 2015, same-sex partners could not get married. That put their family, their, the legal definition of their family in jeopardy. It made it very hard for same-sex couples to have families, and it made their home lives very unstable, not because they were bad parents, not because they weren't a real family, but because there's there are legal obligations and legal privileges and legal rights that come with being a family. But if you're not married and you can't get married, then it kind of puts a lot of barriers in place. 
So that's a problem. Another problem, another controversy is who can adopt. Even though we have same-sex marriage in our country now, some states don't allow same-sex adoptions or they make it very difficult. Alabama is one of those states. Alabama has a law that allows religious um, adoption agencies to not adopt to same-sex couples. Well, if most of, if not all of your adoption agencies in the state are religiously based and they all have something against same-sex partners, then it really makes it hard for same-sex couples to adopt. And then if you can't adopt, then you can't have family. You can't have the family that you want and that you deserve. And so that is a, that's a problem. Um, who gets custody of the child? That can become an issue. Um, again, same-sex couples. I bring this up because it's the not only the easiest definition, but it's also an area of, of interest for me and an area of research for me. But like courts don't always like to award in a divorce, for example, say, you know, two people are married, a man and a woman are married, one of them re realizes that they're gay, they get divorced, and they're, you know, married to their new partner, the court is not going to give custody to the same sex partner, even if the biological mother has nothing to do with the child. The court in a conservative state like Alabama, not going to happen. So like that is an issue that puts a huge wrench in this family stability wheel. So again, that's a problem. And as I talked about earlier, how many legally unrelated people can live in the same dwelling? You know, some families, in some cultures, you have multiple generations living under one roof. Okay, that, that will be fine because they're all related, but what if you see family differently? What if you have multiple generations living under one roof, but you're not all related? So that makes it hard for your family to stay together. And so that can be a problem. And we'll talk a lot about the legal challenges that families face as we progress in the semester. Now, the, um, I want you to make sure if you haven't read the book, because I know some of you are not going to read the book, but there's a little box called How, um, How the U.S. Census Counts Families. It's on pages 9 to 11 in the textbook. I know some people just skip the little boxes even if they read, but you should read it because there might be a question or three on the test from this section. So be sure you read that because that is really interesting. Um, just spoiler alert, the way the census, one of the ways the census has counted families in the past is who all eats dinner with you. That's an interesting way to count family because I don't live with my parents, but I often eat dinner with my parents because I don't like to cook for one person. So how would the census count me? I don't know. You'll have to read the book to find out. Now, this type of family is probably the most convoluted. It's very, it, it's very, very, very confusing. And if you go to the book and you read the book, there's a little video in the ebook that you can watch that does a really good job of explaining it. I couldn't embed it in the PowerPoint, but I think you should go and, um, and watch it because you have access to the book for the first week of class, so go do it. And this type is family as an institutional arena. What does that even mean? Okay, well, this is a sociology term. So let's, let's pause. Let's pause it and define institutional arena first. So an institutional arena is a social space where relations between people in common positions are governed by rules of interaction. And these rules can be either legal rules, like the law says if you're a parent, you have to take care of your child and social rules. The law, the law doesn't really, the law gives like a basic definition of what taking care of a child would look like, but in society we have our own unwritten rule about what that looks like. Like, you know, the, the law doesn't really say you, you have to discipline your child, but society kind of expects that you discipline your child, and society has different expectations for what that would look like. So those are all rules of interaction. So with this idea in mind, the family as an institutional arena is the space where society, so the state and the market, and the family interact. So it's sort of, it's not like a, it's not like Jordan Hare Stadium, but it kind of is. Because it's a place where you do your family and you've got different, and you're having to face different challenges and there are different rules that you have to navigate in order to be at the family. Now this is a very complex, the most complex type of family that we're going to be talking about because it's made up of inter, intricate bi-directional interactions between all three arenas. What does that mean? Okay, intricate means just complicated. 
Um, bidirectional means that the relationship or the interaction goes both ways. So the family is imp impacting the state, the state is impacting the family. The family is impacting the market, the market is impacting the family, the state is impacting the market, the market's impacting the state. So there's, there's give and take between all of them. And the three arenas, as I said earlier, are the mark, the state, the market, and the family. Those are the three arenas. Um, it's also very important because like the personal family and like the legal family, it determines a lot about both individual and family development. The experiences that you have, this the sort of these sort of like invisible lines between you and other people determine a lot about who you are. And because families are made up of individuals, it also determines a lot about how families develop. So I think for a lot of people, especially when you're not in HGFS and you're not and you're not sort of attuned to looking at the world in a series of interactions and, and overlaps, it's easy to think about these three arenas as sort of monoliths or separate entity. So like the family, which provides care, nurturing, and support. It's where all the intimate things of life happen, love, childbearing, um, nurturing, teaching, training, caring. And not like teaching and training like what we're doing, but like learning how to ride a bike, learning how to do dishes, learning how not to be a, you know, a, a annoying person. Like learning how to be a productive member of society that happens within this family sphere. Um, then we have the state, which is like this, this large institution that encompasses a lot of who we are and it maintains order. The, the purpose of the state is to maintain order by laws and by force. And force doesn't just mean like the police come and knock down your door and drag you out and arrest you if you do bad, do bad things, but, but also the court. The court is a force. Um, you know, punishing people, issuing fines, um, putting people in jail, that's force because you're being required to do something. So the state's role is to make sure that your the family is allowed to do its job, but also to make sure that the family is doing its job. Then we have the market, and the market provides a mean the means of support. So without the market, the family can't exist and the state can't exist. Um, and the other way around. But do these things exist sort of like by themselves? Well, as I've kind of been touching on as, we've, as what I've been defining them is no, they don't exist by themselves. They're not, they're not independent, they're not separated, they permeate one another and there's interplay between each other and, and what one does influences what the, happens to the other and vice versa. So we've got, okay, the first, the first thing, the family. We've talked about the family, cares, nurtures, and supports. And then we've got its overlap with the state. The state maintains order by laws and by force. And this interaction between the two, the space where they where they mesh, um, is a set of interactions. The state, the state says who can get married. The state says who can adopt. They provide police who protect the family from outside influences trying to interfere with the family doing its job. But it also has child protective services. It makes sure the family is doing its job. If you neglect your kids, the state takes them away from you. Um, it also provides public education. It provides a lot of other things, but those are some big ones. But they're not just giving to the to the family. They're not just they're not just enforcing rules on the family. The family also is interacting on them. The family can participate in civic life by voting, by paying taxes, by running for public office, by petitioning their public officials, by influencing policies that that determine who can get married and who can adopt and what constitutes child abuse or not. So there's interaction between these two. Then we have the market. The market provides means of support. What are means of support? Groceries, jobs, medicine, child care, massages, haircuts, um, things like that. So you've got this interaction then between the family and the market, where the market is providing wages, benefits, purchase, and purchasable goods and services. Without the market, the family can't support itself because there wouldn't be jobs, there wouldn't be insurance, um, there wouldn't be the ability to have kids in daycare so that you can go to work. Um, wouldn't be able to have groceries or food or go on vacation without the market. And all those things are important. 
But there's also an interaction between the state and the market. The state provides regulation to the market. The state says you have to provide a minimum wage. We'll talk about that in a minute, How not today, but you know, in a couple lectures. We'll talk about wages. But the state regulates wages. It regulates benefits. It regulates um, the way that the market interacts with the family. But the market provides something really important to the state. It provides a tax base. Now, you may not have thought about that, but without the market, without the economy, there would be no state because there would be no taxes. Um, you know, yes, the family pays taxes, but they only pay taxes because the market exists. And so you've got a really important interaction between these two as well. Um, they None of them can exist really without the other, or at least not in the way that we understand it and, and enjoy our current modern life. But then you've got this interesting interaction, this overlap in the middle. And that's an important thing that we can't ignore. And it's because and the reason we can't ignore it is because it will form really a large chunk of what we talk about in this course. The interaction of the state, the market, and the family um, it influences the decisions that families make. It influences the stability of the family. Are there good jobs? Does that give, are there good jobs that gives the family the ability to raise their family the way they want to, to provide the kind of education they want their kids to have? Does it enable them to participate in civic life? Those are decisions are all going to be impacted by, by the market and by the and by the policies that the state uses to regulate the market. If the market's allowed to do whatever it wants and it impact negatively impacts the family, then the interaction right here in the middle would be the family is probably going to suffer and they're going to be unstable. So family decisions and stability are impacted by the policies of the state and the economic stability provided by the market. And we will talk more about that when we talk about social class in a few um, lectures. Okay. So now, um, what I'm going to have you do, and this will be your discussion, we, there won't be any discussions for the next couple of classes, but because I want you to work on this homework. And you'll find the homework if you go to Canvas, in modules, go to the week one module, and then open the homework one assignment. And your homework is going to be to submit a 500 word essay. And an essay is complete sentences in a paragraph form not bullet points. If you give me bullet points, you will get points taken off. I want an essay. I want a paragraph that is 500 words. If you need, if you don't want to count each one, then do it in Word, and there's a little thing at the bottom that says word count. It tells you how many words you have. Write me a 500 word essay that defines your perspective on the family. So you don't even have to include any of the terms we just talked about. I just want to know right off the bat, what do you think a family is? So there are eight questions that you have to answer as part of that. So who is the family? Do you have to be related to be part of a family? What role does the family play in an individual's development? What role does the fam individual play in the development of other members in the family? Do the members in the family share the same values and beliefs, or do they have to? What role does the family play in society? How does culture or society define or impact the family, and how is your view of the family informed by your own family? So you don't necessarily have to write one sentence for each of these things, but what I want to know, I want to know what you think a family is based on all of these different questions. And there's a rubric. You have to address all of these questions in order to get full credit. Look at the rubric. It'll tell you how I'm going to assign the points. Um, please do this. It is due on Wednesday the 27th by 11.59 p.m. Central Time. Be sure to submit it. You can either do it as a text box submission, a Word document, or a PDF. It does not matter to me how you do it. Um, just make sure that you get it submitted to me. If you have questions or you're not sure how to do this, then send me an email or come to my office hours on Friday from 1 to 2.30. Um, or get, come Friday. Don't don't put it off till Tuesday because, I mean, you can come Tuesday, but my office hours are the same both days, 1 to 2.30 Central. But don't put it off until Tuesday. Um, try to get started on this. You can work on it a little bit every day until um, the day that it's due. Uh, it's the way that I'm intending for you to do it so you don't have to sit down and do the whole thing in one sitting. All right, for next time, email me any questions that you have about class one. My email is on the canvas. I'm not going to say it on the video because I'm posting these to YouTube and I don't want people to email me <laughs> who are not in the class. 
And I want you to start working on homework one. And then before you watch the next lecture, um, read pages 16 to 31 in your textbook, and then watch the class three lecture. So that's what you need to do for next time. I will see you at class three. Thanks for paying attention. Hope you enjoyed the class. Let me know if you have any questions.